Hello, friends. I'll be talking on this uh, topic, which is biomarkers. So this talk I had given as part of a brick that was conducted in Bangalore uh, on 8th of December. So it's a fairly theoretical subject. Uh, so we'll just try to cover the... So there are around 178 biomarkers. So obviously you can talk about this the whole day. Uh, try to pick up the ones which may be more pertinent to our clinical practice and uh, which holds promise for the future. So the topics that I would be covering is a bit on the background on the biomarkers as to why we need these biomarkers and uh, and what makes the ideal biomarker. And we look into the whole categorization of biomarkers. As I said, there are around 170 to 180 biomarkers. So, and we need to categorize it into different groups to have some clarity as to their origin, their sources of uh, origin. So, some of the basic biomarkers will start off with ESR. So, I'm sure every one of you here would have listened to this, heard about this ESR. CRP, which is a little traditional archaic sort of a biomarker, which uh, we saw the resurgence of its usage during COVID. Then, procalcitonin. I think this is something which we have been using it and possibly this is here to stay because of a good sort of an evidence that has evolved into uh, its utility in uh, sepsis. Then these are some of the newer ones, Pentraxin 3, which is a little similar to CRP. We'll talk about it. And there's something called Proadrenomedulin, which I'll talk briefly. Then there is a STREM1, which is soluble triggering receptor. So this is the triggering receptor. Uh, expressed on the myeloid cell. So, this is a myeloid cell. So, the acronym that is used is TREM. So, it's a triggering receptor expressed on myeloid cell. Then there is this HMGB1 protein, which is high mobility group box 1 protein. And all these green ones are the box 1 proteins that come out from the lysosomes and the nucleus. Very briefly, we'll talk on that. And there's a whole cosmos of inflammatory cells, which we call as the immune biomarkers. Uh, so, this is also a huge area. So, a lot of immune cells participate in different types of biomarkers and receptors. So, I'll just give you a brief overview on how the advances are happening. And we'll talk a bit on omics, proteomics, metabolomics, genomics, and a bit of a summary. So, as I said, there are around 178 biomarkers. The reason why there are so many biomarkers because the sepsis pathophysiology itself is quite complex and there are multiple uh, sort of a variables that are involved in the whole pathophysiology of the sepsis. And when we talk about sepsis, so we, uh, we all understand there is a huge cytokine storm that happens. There is a lot of pro-inflammatory variables and a lot of inflammatory markers. And then you have these complements. So there are biomarkers which are derived from this complement set. And there are biomarkers which are derived from the inflammatory mediators and cytokines. And there are biomarkers which are derived from the apoptosis process. And then you have biomarkers which are derived from the inflammasomes. And there are biomarkers which are derived from the coagulation cascade. So these are the grouping of the biomarkers. And I'll show you how. So, so the whole question is, what is their clinical utility of these biomarkers? Whether Because there are so many biomarkers and we need to just ponder about their clinical utility. But so far to this date, there are only five biomarkers which are studied more extensively whose sensitivity is more than, because there are a lot of biomarkers which people have tested, but their sensitivities and specificities is very uh, varied and uh, may not really come to a reasonable level for it to be adopted into the clinical practice. So there are only five which have a sensitivity of more than 90%, which could be incorporated into clinical practice. And we know that procalcitonin, which we are using it, we'll talk a little more on that. And CRP are the more commonly used biomarkers to this date. But uh, they do not have an ability to differentiate. The whole pitfalls of any biomarkers is they have a lot of other, whole lot of reasons why these biomarkers show up or they get expressed or their levels get elevated. And uh, they're not very specific to sepsis most of the time. And it's very hard to differentiate between the sepsis and SERS by any of these biomarkers. So when you talk about grouping of biomarkers or categorization of the biomarkers, 
So we could categorize it into uh, acute the biomarkers derived from acute proteins, complement system, and coagulation system. Coagulation system is simple. So the ones that are marked in the red is what we tend to use clinically, CRP. Pentraxin-3, as I said, is similar to CRP, PT, APTT. From the complement, you have various sort of a complements which, uh, uh, which get released in the sepsis and which can be used as a biomarker. So this is from the complex protein systems. Then, as I said, there is a whole cosmos of the immune cells. Immune cells produce various biomarkers, various receptors. So the ones that are marked in the red is what we may have heard of and which are used clinically also, tumor necrosis factor receptor. HLA-DR, which I will talk very briefly, is a very important marker to prognosticate sepsis. As I said, biomarker is not only for diagnosis, it, they are useful even for prognostication of the sepsis. And HLA-DR expression on the myeloid cells is a very useful predictor. There are at least 13 clinical studies which has looked into the expression of HLA-DR. We'll talk about it. So basically, you have these mononuclear cells, lymphocyte, polymorph nuclear cells, which express various receptors and uh, uh, various sort of a uh, biomarkers, which could be identified for us to diagnose and even to prognosticate sepsis. Then there are biomarkers which are derived from the vascular tissues. So here I'm sure the ones which we commonly hear is the procalcitonin. So procalcitonin gets released following injury to the cells or a tissue. It can be any tissue or any cell. And lactate, we know it is present in every cell and that gets sort of released when there is an anaerobic metabolism that happens. And there are certain biomarkers which are derived from the gut. And I'm sure many of you would have heard of the biomarkers derived from endothelial cells, like intracellular adhesion molecule, vascular cell adhesion molecule, e cell and so on and so forth. Then we may not be possibly touching this area in this talk because we are talking about biomarkers in sepsis. So there are biomarkers specific to the nerve cells. So the one which we possibly would have heard commonly is the neuron-specific enolase, NSE. And TREM, I did speak. Um, so it's the triggering receptor expressed on the myeloid cells. And syndecan is the glycocalyx byproduct. So it's a glycocalyx uh, end product which comes again from the endothelium. And now people are uh, really looking at these biomarkers which come out from the glycocalyx uh, degraded products also as an early indicator of sepsis. So we will focus on few things which are clinically relevant and where certain studies have been done. And as I said, where sensitivities are found to be more than 90%, they may be of more utility for us. So how should be the ideal biomarker? So there are certain characteristics of ideal biomarker. So it should be available in an easy way. So the, the availability should be easy. And there should be ease of using this biomarker. It should not be very complicated to use this biomarker. And the biomarker should be rapidly available because there should not be huge turnaround time. And the biomarker should be very fluidic in nature and should be very dynamic with regards to the clinical situation. Because sepsis is not a static process. It's a process in continuum. Either they'll be worsening or they'll be getting better. And biomarkers should reflect whether the process is getting better or they're getting worse. So it should be either it should increase or decrease and it should correlate with the progression of the sepsis. It should be objective. It should not be discrete. And ideal biomarker should have good sensitivity and good specificity and should be continuous. And uh, when there is a subsequent infection, this is very important. In ICU, uh, when a patient comes, they can have secondary infections whilst they are in ICU. And biomarkers should be able to reflect the subsequent infection and there should not be sort of a fatigue component which sets in and biomarker does not go up in subsequent infections like tachyphylaxis if you are to look at that analogy. So they, it should reflect even with the repeated infections and even it should reflect even in immunocompromised patients. And biomarkers should have a good correlation with the severity of the sepsis and it should have a good correlation with the mortality. And most importantly, it should be cost effective and it should be affordable. So these are typical sort of a characteristics of an ideal biomarker. And another important thing is most of the biomarkers that are studied sometimes are dependent on coexisting comorbid conditions. Like if someone has a liver dysfunction, like CRP, CRP cannot be relied upon when there is a liver dysfunction. So there are certain biomarkers which can't be relied when there is a kidney dysfunction, which we will talk about. So they should not be influenced by the coexisting comorbid problems and, should, and they should not be 
uh, interfered by any any intervention apart from the antibiotic use any other intervention should not interfere with their reading or with their manifestation so these are some of the typical uh, characteristics of an ideal biomarker so you can keep this picture in mind and this can be asked in exam biomarker sepsis biomarker can be a question i think it was asked also in one of the exam so it is good to have this picture in mind so let us look into what really happens uh, in the body when the biomarkers are released. So you have this pathogen associated molecular patterns and damage associated molecular patterns. So there is a cell which gets injured. So following injury, so the macrophages get activated and they express this toll-like receptor. TLR4 is the toll-like receptor 4 receptor. And this expression, so when there is a tissue damage, the tissue releases procalcitonin. And when the macrophage gets activated and there is a TLR4 expression. So for all the audience, uh, one, needs, one thing we need to bear in mind is the effectiveness of countering the sepsis depend on the activated macrophages. So I will show you as we go along. The immune cells, basically the end result is activation of macrophages and macrophages produce interferon gamma and they are very protective. So activation of macrophages is important. So when there is activation of macrophages, there is release of all this interleukin-8, tumor necrosis, IL-6. So the IL-6 is what is needed for release of CRP from the liver. So IL-6 facilitates the production of CRP from the liver. That's why CRP reading cannot be relied upon in a liver dysfunction patient because it is dependent on the liver function and IL-6 production by the activated macrophages. So this is a sort of uh, pathophysiological aspects as to how certain key biomarkers that today we use like PCT and CRP get produced or get activated. And uh, sepsis conundrum has it's been recognized. There are three distinctive stages in the sepsis conundrum. And it is shown very clearly that the if, if sepsis mortality is 40%, the 10 per, only 10% 10 of the death tend to happen in an acute phase, which is the third phase. So the 30% of the death tend to happen in the later part of the sepsis or what we call as post-sepsis syndrome or it is called by various names like compensated anti-inflammatory response syndrome, CAR. That is where the organ dysfunction would have set in and organ dysfunction wouldn't get better even after you have effectively addressed the antibiotic usage, fluid resuscitation, so on and so forth. So, uh, summarily, you can keep in mind 10% of sepsis death happen in the acute phase, 30% tend to happen in the later phase where organ dysfunctions don't get better even after attaining good hemodynamic stability. And it's a post-sepsis syndrome or post-sepsis immune suppression that tends to happen. So that's about the background of all the biomarkers. So we'll talk about each biomarker, the relevant ones. So starting with ESR, so you might have read, we all have read about this from MBBS. So, so very simplistically remember, erythrocyte sedimentation is the rate within one hour, how much sediment happens. So the more sediment happens, so you have a high ESR. So, and this is, this sedimentation is dependent on increased fibrinogen, which is a biomarker. So ESR basically represents in a hour, how quickly the sedimentation of red blood cells happen and the distance above with the affluent or the serum that you take, that gives you the measure of ESR. So some of the key advantages of ESR is it is easy and you don't need a skill level. You just take the blood, put it in the tube and allow it to clot. And how quickly the blood cells are sedimenting within one hour is what will indicate to you the ESR. So you don't need a skill level and it is very cheap to do it. So these are some of the advantages. The disadvantages is very non-specific. It can go up in multiple conditions. I'm sure you know it goes up with many inflammatory conditions and it, it has some variability with age as well. And temperature also has an effect on ESR. And, and most of these biomarkers, you'll be hearing this as a repetition from me, that they go up in a lot of non-infectious causes, like ESR can go up in cancer patients, in any inflammatory conditions like SLE, rheumatoid arthritis, colitis, and ESR can go up in CKD. As I said, the ideal biomarker, it should not be influenced by uh, coexisting comorbid, so it can go up in CKD patients also. That's why these are some of the disadvantages of ESR. So we'll move to CRP. So as I said, CRP, when there is a inflammation, IL-6 gets released and this will facilitate the production of CRP by the liver. So, and it is 115 kDA protein. 
so crp acutely rises 4 hours after the onset of infection the crp rises and it doubles the crp levels doubles in 8 hours and reaches the peak in 36 to 40 hours so the half life of crp is around 19 hours so the advantages of doing crp is it can be used as a screening because it goes up very acutely within 4 hours after infection and it does indicate the the rise in crp corroborates with the severity of the infections and crp may also indicate response to the antibodies we have seen this in covid times where we used crp as a level to indicate the severity of covid and the response also and that is and IL, il6 was il6 levels and crp levels were taken into consideration to even use tocilizumab in uh, covid patients so it does sort of indicate whether your infection is settling down getting better or getting worse so advantage is it is easy to use and it is low cost uh, the sensitivity of crp is put somewhere between 68 to 92% and specificity is 42 so as you see specificity is very less and sensitivity also is hugely variable so the disadvantages of uh, crp is it is non specific and as i said liver because it is produced by the liver it is unreliable in liver dysfunction or liver failure and even crp has no ability to delineate between infectious and non infectious causes of sepsis and crp can go up in trauma patients burns patients and in any inflammatory conditions post surgical patients and even it can go up in acute coronary syndromes or acute mi so this so these are typical disadvantages you will keep hearing with every biomarker pretty much and the what about the clinical uh, utility so there are few studies so in neonatal sepsis it is shown that crp less than 10 mg one can possibly safely stop antibiotics and that came in one of this indian study and this was a brazilian study where they looked at using crp to uh, stop antibiotics or to continue antibiotics and they found that in the group where crp was used they could curtail the use of antibiotics by one day so with crp usage antibiotic usage was for 6 days versus 7 days and lot of crp studies have been done in pneumonia and where they have arrived at if it is less than 20 one can safely consider holding the antibiotics if it is more than 100 definitely antibiotics have to be considered and we have used crp in these lung infections in covid as well uh, so in most studies with regards to crp are done in pneumonia patients so we spoke about esr we spoke about crp we'll talk a little bit of pentraxin 3 as i said pentraxin 3 is similar to crp and pentraxin 3 is produced by all the inflammatory cells so all the immune cells or inflammatory cells are the ones which produce unlike crp which is produced by the liver and increase in pentraxin 3 has a reasonably good correlation with the severity of sepsis and the studies with pentraxin as the the pentraxin level has been looked into in the albios trial where they looked at 958 patients and they found that increase in the pentraxin had a good correlation with the severity of sepsis and had a good correlation with the organ dysfunction and had a good relation, uh, correlation with the mortality and this was the finding in the patient cohort group from the albios trial it happened in sepsis so so that's the thing about pentraxin so obviously uh, the ease of availability is still not there so this is little similar to crp so now we'll dwell a little bit on procalcitonin which is the sort of a dependable biomarker which we are using and as i said any tissue injury tends to produce Uh, procalcitonin it is derived from any of the cells that are subject to some insult or injury so but there are certain caveats of procalcitonin day one increase in the procalcitonin has shown to be non contributory and day one increase in the procalcitonin does not indicate whether there was a prior infection or whether there is a non infectious causes and in focal infections if you have a localized abscess somewhere so procalcitonin can be low and it can mislead the diagnosis and there is a lag time of 24 to 48 hours for the procalcitonin to reach the peak level so these are all the studies there are around seven studies which uh, highlights all these limitations and that's why there is reluctance on the intensivists to use procalcitonin as a diagnostic tool so right now our understanding is procalcitonin is used at this point of time to stop or discontinue antibiotics or deescalate antibiotics and procalcitonin is not a uh, tool to be used to start or initiate antibiotic 
because the signs and symptoms of infections and non infections are very similar and procalcitonin also not necessarily can always delineate between infectious and non infectious causes so there are two two important there are many trials and uh, there are at least around 22 trials in procalcitonin so we'll talk about the key trials so the pro rata trial all the trainees should know this is a good trial that came from the french group in 2002 where they did the 67 percent of the patients included in this were mechanically ventilated 50 percent of the patients had community acquired infections and 50 percent had hospital acquired infections conducted in 621 ICUs and they randomized between Procal group and the control group and they found that the antibiotic three days, which is patients where antibiotic usage was less, was significantly better in Procal study. It was 14.3 versus 11.6. So, which means the antibiotic three days was more in PCT, which is a good thing and outcomes were better in Procalcitonin group. And in 2018, there was this meta-analysis of 11 randomized control trials with 2,252 patients and they found that the patients where antibiotic usage was guided by procalcitonin, the mortality was significantly less, 21.1% versus 23.7%. And the duration of antibiotic was significantly less in the procal group. This came from the Switzerland group and meta-analysis. And the most recent two studies, which uh, for all the trainees possibly should know, is this PROGRESS trial, which came in August 2020 by the Greek authors. So here, the rationale was that uh, whether the antibiotic usage can be reduced and where PCT was used as a guidance in sepsis to see if long-term long infection-related adverse events could be minimized with the use of procalcitonin. This was a multicentric trial done in 266 pa sepsis patients. The source of sepsis was either pneumonia, bacteremia, or pyelonephritis. So it was a one-to-one -one randomization. Procalcitonin guided discontinuation of antibiotic in one group was a standard group. So they stopped antibiotics. Discontinuation of antibiotics happened when there was more than 80% reduction in the procalcitonin, which means one would do serial trends of procalcitonin. Once the procalc comes down to more than 80% of the baseline, one would stop antibiotics or absolute value of procalcitonin less than 0.5 micrograms per liter at day 5 was the reason they could stop the antibiotics. The primary outcome was to look at infection-related adverse events and the new infections uh, with MDR, or clostridium or death as a composite endpoint also was looked as a primary endpoint. Secondary outcome was to look at 28-day mortality and duration of antibiotics and the cost. So this was a good study, 266 patients, so 123 and, uh, in Procal group and 131 in the standard group. So infection-related adverse events at day 180, as you see, was significantly less in the Procal group, 7.2% versus 15.3%. 28-day mortality also significantly less in the Procal group. Duration of antibiotic also. So this was a hugely positive study. One of the latest sort of a randomized controlled trial from the Greek group in 2020. And even the costs, all the endpoints, primary endpoints, secondary, all were positive in this. So duration of antibiotic was less. And seldom do we see a study where you could see a mortality reduction also. Here, when less antibiotics was used or de-escalated or discontinued based on procalcitonin, there was a mortality benefit also. So the conclusions they made from this was where PCT guidance was used in sepsis, there was reduction in the infection-related adverse event, and there was reduction in the 28-day mortality, and even the cost was less. So the most latest meta-analysis just came three to four days back before this talk. So this was from the Hungarian group. It was the largest meta-analysis. Papem et al. It came in critical care just few days back. So procalcitonin guided antibiotic therapy may shorten length of treatment and improve survival. Systematic review. So here they have taken all the randomized control trials till date, which I said was 26 randomized control trials, 9,048. So this is possibly the, the largest study that we could possibly quote on the relevance of usage of procalcitonin. Here they showed 28-day mortality was significantly less if in the group where procalcitonin was used as a guide to stop antibiotics. And duration of antibiotics was decreased by minus 1.79 days in procal group as compared to the control group. And all this was statistically significant. And the, But 
recurrent infections was found to be more in the procalcitonin group and all these were statistically significant. So the risk of recurrent infections was more where procalcitonin was, top, was used to stop the antibiotics. Then they looked at secondary infections and IQ and hospital length of stay, there was no difference. So this is the most recent meta-analysis, including all the randomized control trials, 26 randomized control trials, largest sort of a subgroup of patients, where they showed a very good benefit with the use of procalcitonin with mortality. So this alludes to the Greek randomized control trials. It also showed reduction in mortality if you use procalcitonin to guide de-escalation or stopping of antibiotics. So this is the take-home message for all our trainees that procalcitonin is here to stay. And this is a very important biomarker which one could use to de-escalate or stop antibiotics sooner than later by day five or whenever the levels come to less than 80% or less than 0.5, one could safely stop. So that's about Procal. So I had to speak a little bit on Procal because this is the most relevant biomarker which, which is here to stay, which we can continue to use. So then there is this proadrenomedulin. So this is a biomarker which is again produced by various tissues following injury. And the key mechan the actions of proadrenomedulin is they have vasodilatory action, antimicrobial effect, and anti-inflammatory effect. So proadrenomedulin is produced in the brain. It is produced by the lungs, by the heart. And it is, it is produced by the fat also. It is present in the adipose tissue and it is produced by the kidney. So these are the places from where proadrenomedulin gets produced or gets manifested. So the clinical utility, it is shown to be higher in sepsis than in SERS. And it tends to delineate between, so we have all the biomarkers have problem delineating between SERS and sepsis. So proadrenomedulin has an ability to delineate and differentiate between the sepsis in neutropenic patient and in the SERS patients. And like procalcitonin, levels may not go up in a focal infection like an abscess. But proadrenomedulin goes up even with a focal infection or abscess. And it is shown to be superior to procalcitonin. And it has a good correlation with regards to mortality in pneumonia patients. Disadvantage is, so proadrenomedulin possibly may come into the forefront because it is shown to be a little superior to Procal and it gets expressed even in the focal infections and it can differentiate between SERS and sepsis. Disadvantage is the cost and it is not easily available. And like any other biomarker, their expression also increases in heart failure patients. So these are some of the disadvantages of proadrenomidin. We'll talk very briefly on soluble triggering receptor expressed on myeloid cells. So this is the receptor, triggering receptor expressed on myeloid cell. So this receptor gets expressed when there is an exposure to either bacteria or to the fungi. Sensitivity is found to be 82%. Specificity is found to be 86%. And the admission stream is more. It is shown to have a good correlation with increase in mortality. And rapid decline is shown to have a good correlation with improved outcome. It is like a lactate. Rapid decrease in lactate, improvement in the outcome. Rapid increase in the lactate, worse than outcome. So it is similar to that in that sense but it can increase even in the acute MIs or heart attacks. So those are some of the key features of STREM. And the assay method, the type of assay that is used to identify this STREM uh, has a bearing on its accuracy and the interpretation of the value. So very briefly, we'll talk on presepsin. So presepsin is a 13 KDA protein. So presepsin, as the name sounds, this is like CRP I said, it increases four hours after the infection. Presepsin is much early. It starts increasing just two hours after the exposure to the infection. Half-life is four to five hours. But presepsin levels is not affected by burns and neutropenia, which is an advantage. Sensitivity is found to be 87.8%. Specificity is found to be 81.4%. So the prognostic value has been indicated in the Albios trial. Disadvantage of presepsin is it is non-specific and it can go up in the acute or chronic hepatitis like hepatitis B, presepsin levels can go up and it goes up in psoriasis and, and fever patients, febrile patients. Another disadvantage of presepsin is it, it did not show increase in UTI. And UTI is a significant sort of a sepsis cohort that we deal in ICU. So presepsin possibly may not see the light of the day because we need biomarkers which goes up in any infections and this is a biomarker which did not go up in UTIs and that may be a very uh, limiting factor for its usage.
So very briefly on the high mobility group box one protein. As I said, high mobility group box one protein are these green ones which are released from the lysosomes and the nucleus of the cells following injury. And they tend to peak in 8 to 12 hours and plateaus in 18 to 32 hours. Day 3 levels of HMGB1 protein can delineate whether the pro and helps in prognostication between survivors and non-survivors. Sensitivity is 66%, which is very low. As I said, we need biomarkers which are sensitivity at least more than 90%. Specificity, specificity also is low. So these are some of the limitations. The disadvantage is it is non-specific and like any other biomarker, it can go up in any inflammatory conditions like colitis, SLE, rheumatoids, one and so forth. And it can increase in the cancer patients also. So these are some of the highlights of HMGB1 protein. So those are all about the biomarkers, or typical conventional biomarkers released from the tissue. We'll talk a bit on this whole cosmic world of immune cells. These are the new sort of a dimensions where a lot of research is happening. So any of these immune cells, like you take these dendritic cells, monocytes, macrophage, natural killer cells, myeloid cells, lymphocytes, all of them express different biomarkers. So we know in sepsis, there is, in post sepsis, there is some energy cells get fatigued. And when they get fatigued, there is no sort of a great response to the endotoxin and there is increased apoptosis that happens. And in the post sepsis, it is shown that neutrophils also are fatigued and they have impaired ability to do the clearance of the organism. They produce reactive oxygen species and they fail to get recruited to the site of inflammation. And it is shown that in the post sepsis that the natural killer cells also come down and there is alteration in the natural killer cells and there is increased and there is reduced production of interferon. Interferon gamma is very protective in sepsis. As I said, you need interferon gamma and you need activated macrophages, and these are all protective in, in sepsis. So in post-sepsis, the production of these interferon gamma by the natural killer cells come down, and there is increased production of myeloid-dependent uh, stem cells that also get uh, released. And there are these dendritic cells where there is altered phenotype and there is reduced cytokine production, and there is reduced expression of HLA-DR. I think if you recall, I mentioned HLA-DR, is a very important biomarker where a lot of research is happening because if there is a failure of expression of HLA-DR, it indicates immune failure and it means the outcomes are bad. So this was a very important, there are at least 13 clinical studies on HLA-DR. As you see, this is one study where in 37 patients, there was a good HLA-DR expression of more than 8,000. The death, the mortality was 10%. But if the HLA-DR expression was less than 8,000, you saw the mortality was 65%. So HLA-DR is an important immune biomarker expressed on the dendritic cells, which helps in prognosticating whether patients get better or they don't do well in sepsis. So this is how the whole immune sort of unfolding is happening. And our understanding. So these are the 13 clinical studies on HLA-DR. And measurement of uh, HLA-DR is shown to have a bearing on immune adjunctive therapies therapies with the GM-CSF, granular macro, macrophage, polystimulating factor, and even including adjuncts with treatment with interferon gamma. So other inflammatory mediators which can be used as a biomarker, which are generated from the immune cells is the pro-inflammatory sort of a markers like IL-2, interferon gamma, interleukin-17, all this can be looked at as biomarkers. And there is a lot of anti-inflammatory mediators which can be looked at as like interleukin-2, co-inhibitory receptor of programmed cell death 1 or cytotoxic T lymphocyte A4. And even the science is advancing to a point of looking at the ATP production of, from the lymphocytes. But at this point of time, there's no gold standard for evaluating the immune. So these are all the biomarkers to indicate how your immune function is happening. Whether your immune function is optimal, whether it is immune or whether you are in a stage of immune failure. So that's all you need to remember. I think the key element, if you can remember, is the HLA DR, which is a good indication of your immune suppression. That should be good enough. So based on this, there are some immunotherapy agents like RHIL, recombinant human, interleukin-7, or anti-programmed death-1 antibodies. All these are being devised as tools to activate the immune system. So this very quickly, I'll take you. There are two biomarkers which are found to be favorable in sepsis, which means if you have expression of these biomarkers, 
they say that your outcome in sepsis is better. There are only two things you need to remember, interleukin-7 and interleukin-15. So interleukin-7 uh, produced mainly from the thymus and other cells. They cause expression of this receptor on the T cells, which leads to uh, reduction in the apoptosis because it activates T cells. Interleukin-7 activates T cells to express receptors, reduce the apoptosis. And then the activated T cells produce interferon gamma. So you only have to remember interferon gamma is good for sepsis because they activate macrophages. And it leads to good antigenic expression. And activated macrophages, it leads to increase in the integrin. And there is more migration of the inflammatory cells to the site of infection. So you can just remember this as interleukin-7 is good, interleukin-15 is good, interferon gamma is good, activated macrophages are good because these are the ones which are protective in sepsis and they all can be used as biomarkers to prognosticate. And as I said, interleukin-15 is needed for the binding of these activated macrophages to all the CD8 cells and this leads to increased, again, leads to increased production of interferon gamma, which is very good. And interleukin-15 helps in the binding of activated macrophages to the natural killer cells, which again produce interferon gamma. So if you see the whole pathway, the, the end point of these pathways is production of interferon gamma, activation of macrophages, and all the good things that happen, clonal expansion, differentiation, cytotoxicity, activation, so on and so forth. And all this eventually will lead to reduction in the apoptosis. So, and the extension of this is all your granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, which are used to produce all these dendritic cells, macrophages, all this need to increase in the HLA DR expression, increase survival, so on and so forth. So these are all the basically these three slides. What I put in is to indicate how you can modulate your immune makeup and which is influences. Because if you remember that graph, 30% of the deaths in sepsis happen in the post-sepsis state, where all your cells get fatigued and there is immune suppression. And these are the pathways that are that are involved in immune suppression. And there are certain biomarkers which indicate whether immune suppression is setting in and some therapeutic modalities in future could be incorporated to activate this uh, sort of immune cells to improve the outcomes in sepsis. So that is where we are heading. So what is the future of biomarkers or the omics? So we are now coming with genomics. Genomics, we talk about multiplex PCR where there is amplification of 16S and 18S RNA to identify the pathogens and the cause of sepsis. Then there is transcriptomics, which look at the single nucleotide polymorphism as the tools to recognize the sepsis. Then there are proteomics. Then there are metabolomics, where you look at the metabolic profile of a sepsis to see, uh, to, to understand, to diagnose, and prognosticate and determine the outcomes in sepsis. So this is where we are headed in future. So the omics would be the future, where we'll be using molecular technology uh, PCR-based and uh, single nucleotide polymorphism-based and creating a metabolic profile to help diagnose, prognosticate, and determine the outcomes in sepsis. So, summary, there are 178 biomarkers. And uh, why there are so many? Because the pathophysiology of sepsis is so complex and we saw so many beautiful pathways. Uh, so, And every pathway, they have identified different biomarkers which can tell us how the sepsis is progressing. But five biomarkers are studied, which have sensitivity of more than 90%. So summarily, at the end of all this theoretical talk, the only biomarkers which are practically available we are using is procalcitonin, which is here to stay, based on that huge meta-analysis you saw of 26 randomized control trials and the progress study. And CRP is in select cases we could use. The newer biomarkers hold promise, but the most excitement is happening in the immune immune biomarkers. When I say immune biomarkers, these are the biomarkers which are produced by all the immune cells, which is like dendritic cells, monocytes, lymphocytes, uh, neutrophils, myeloid cells, so on and so forth. Just remember, in immune, currently the one which is making noise is the HLA-DR expression, which helps us to prognosticate whether sepsis patients get better or they have a high probability of dying. Some of the newer biomarkers which hold promise are the proadrenomedulin, and uh, STREM1, which is the soluble triggering receptor expression on the myeloid cells, and the high mobility group box one protein and presepsin. So these are some of the ones which uh, research is happening. So future pretty much lies in all the genomics, proteomics, trans transcriptomics, and metabolomics. So that would be the 
sort of a overview and the future in biomarker. So thank you one and all. So I request all of you to submit your valuable work to Journal of Acute Care, which comes out every three months. You can visit my website, www.drpradeepagapa.com. So we have to this. Thank you. Thank you one and all.